So you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to say, let's pray. And you're going to start applying these things to your own personal life now because you want the best. You want the excellent. You don't want the best in your life anymore. Now when you're young, you don't look at it quite like that. You catch on to that as you grow up in life. And if you are discipled by people that are seasoned, they're going to hand those things down to you as fast as they possibly can. But Paul is basically saying here, in verse 5, he says, Do not deprive one another except with consent. Sexual uh, relations, you know, are, are, they're, they're, they're proper. For a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, don't give your body too much time away from your wife or your husband when you know that your sexual drive is a problem. The enemy is always, always watching me, watching you to develop an attack on me, to rip me off of my purity and your purity, no matter who you are, where you are, wherever you're going to be. And he's nothing more than a lion that's roaring all the time. And he's going to take on anybody that will come and hit into his path. He don't care who it is, as long as it has flesh. He knows it's weak. He's been studying us for thousands of years. He knows how to get to me. I'm no match for him. So I force him to go through him. See? But I'm here to tell you, don't give too much time away. Know yourself. If you have a problem in this area, whatever, take care of one another's needs correctly. You're making each other strong. You're benefiting one another. So the enemy doesn't develop an attack and, and implement that on you before you know it. You're having a problem in your marriage with someone else that doesn't belong there. Okay. Check this out. Verse 6. But I say this as a permission or a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. You see, let me lay this down to you guys, gals. I didn't know this for many years in my marriage. If you get a woman for a wife, you got a gift. You're blessed. A man who has obtained, who, who, has, who has basically gotten a hold of a woman or a wife has obtained favor from the Lord if he's gotten a wife. But Each one has his own gift. You see, marriage isn't for everybody. See, some of you may be thinking, oh, I just can't, man, I want a man, or I want a woman, Lord, I don't want to, you know, da-da-da. Well, you get it. You may not like it. Marriage is tough. Marriage is W-O-R-K in reality. <laughs> That's what marriage equates to mathematically. You work for a good quality marriage. Do not ever forget what I'm laying down to you. I've been married for 30-something years. Okay? It didn't come easy. You know? I just give my wife a black eye and I took care of business. You know what I'm saying? That's how it's done here. You know? No. Yeah. I put a Velcro vest on her in the back and a Velcro on the wall. I just hang her on the wall. You know, you get it? You know, no. I didn't do that. It's tough. Sometimes we think we're ready for something when in reality we're not. God knows what's best. The point Paul's talking about here is that if you do get that husband, you do get that wife, it's a gift. It's not to be abused. Okay? So often, if you don't wait for what God has for you, you're abused. And you guys know it. Satan comes in and rips you off. He goes on in verse 8. Well, let me throw this out at you. He says, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. 
not everybody has, you know, maybe a gift of evangelism or a gift of teaching or a gift of... We don't have to. We just need everybody. I, I need you and you need me. We, it works better when we're together. You see? Paul says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am, but, but if they cannot exercise self-control, then let them marry. If you're going to burn with lust in your heart every time you see, well, she's fine, she's fine. Well, which one is it when you're horny? Right? It's a no-brain on. Okay? We used to have a bumper sticker when I was a kid, honk if you're horny. The whole street was all honking. You know what I mean? That's a no-brainer. But if you don't have self-control, what are you going to do? You're going to get in trouble. This is what Paul's saying. Hey, don't don't do you know? Don't make another stupid mistake and a stupid mistake and a stupid mistake. Start getting on your knees in your prayer closet, going, "Hey Lord, I I need a woman. It's it, you've given me that desire, that drive to be married. So would you start putting that in my in my path?" Well, there's a lot of preparation for that, in my opinion. If I was your guys' age over here that are young, I wouldn't want a woman that's not in the Word. You want a worldly woman, remember, that's what you've got. Okay? I know a lot of men that have been broken on their knees going, man, oh man, dude, am I paying a high price? And a lot of women the same way, am I paying a high price? I'll take that spiritual woman all day long that when I walk in my house, there's peace in my home. There's no inner turmoil going on. We're cool. You walk in your house and you're you're unevenly yoked with that person because you wanted it. You didn't want to wait on the excellent from God. It's like you're going to war every day in your own home where it should be peaceful. He says, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. That's just wisdom. You see, I don't know about you guys, but up until I was about 50, I thought the sex drive was the number one drive, you know? Well, it's not. It's the drive that drove me to get married, but it's kind of far down on the list. You see, if I was to take you out here to Death Valley right now at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, your first drive would be thirst. <clears throat> be looking for water, big time. Or you'd be sucking air. Or you'd be hungry. Your sexual drive is way down on the list, but it's a drive that God created, has put in us. There's nothing wrong with it. And if you have a desire to be married, you're not desiring a bad thing. And if you can obtain a wife, you're going to obtain favor from the Lord. But I'm here to tell you tonight, be careful in how you're going to go out getting that husband or that wife. If you're going to go look for one, Make sure you're evenly yoked because it's going to create problems in your home. I guarantee you. I've watched it for years. Now, to the married, verse 10, Paul says, but I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Paul is basically going to discourage divorce here. Okay? The world encourages divorce. It's all over TV, all the commercials. I'm amazed. But yet Paul is going to discourage the divorce. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried, okay, or be reconciled to her husband. That's hardcore. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. I'm amazed at how many divorces are going on in the body of Christ, in the church, in the world. Well, I have a hardened heart towards her or this. I don't feel like this. And that's not my problem. You don't think I haven't done that with my wife after 30-something years? Does, what do you want me to do? Just go out and find another woman and start hunkering down with her? That's what many people have done and still do all the time. They don't get their way. See? 
Paul's discouraging that. He says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Talking about a person when you come home, you got a husband that's really not in the Lord. He knows how to, everybody knows how to talk the Christian talk. Praise the Lord, bro. You know, everybody knows what to say when they're around the real Christians. I watch it and watched it for years. Okay? But it doesn't fly. In verse 13, Paul says, And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Now these are tough situations. Going home every day and dealing with a husband or a wife that is an unbeliever that wants nothing to do with anything pertaining to the spiritual thing that touched your life that day with Jesus Christ, they have no desire for it. And you've got to live that way. It's hard. It's hard. Verse 14, For the unbelieving husband, this is what's mind-blowing. Check this out. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified, set apart by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Trip out on that. Remember when they were all in the wilderness back then with Moses? Remember, God made provision for them to stay in fellowship with Him despite of them through the blood sacrifice to the Levitical priesthood that He raised up for them to be able to offer the animals correctly for their sins and atonement for their sins to be at one with God. He knew they were going to commit murder, fornicate, adultery, lie, steal, and cheat, and everything else. And He made provision for them to stay in fellowship with Him through that blood sacrifice. That's the love of God. What's heavy? What's heavy? That's not why that generation did not get to enter into the land. Because they committed murder, fornication, adultery, lying, stealing, and cheating. God made provision for those things when they brought their sacrificed lamb and these other animals to be killed. And it was the shedding of the blood. He didn't allow them to enter in only because they didn't believe. Trip out on that. Listen, <clears throat> Moses was the representative of the people to God and of God to the people. And when Moses disobeyed the direct order of God on what to do when he was supposed to just speak to the rock, he was painting a wonderful picture that was going to be a foreshadowing of what was to come in the future. We know that because of Moses' rebelliousness right then and there, it cost him for not being able to enter into the promised land. The only people that got to enter in were those of 20 years of age and under. They had to wait for everybody to die except for two men, Joshua and Caleb, because the Bible says they had a different spirit in them. Trip out on that. So they got to sit here and wait. This tabernacle has to be torn down by all the Levites that knew their job on how to handle it correctly. And when the fire by night would move or the cloud by day would move, they would tear it down. When it would stop, they would put it back up for 40 years. They would go around the same mountain. And every time, they would approach the Jordan River. But as they would approach, murmuring and complaining would come in. They'd go back around Murmur and complain. Oh, you missed it again. You're getting ready to go over the Jordan River. A land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to be dominated by the things of the Spirit. Now the flesh isn't going to dominate your life no more. You're going to have a great life. 